we're going live on YouTube and then we are gonna try to go live on Facebook also. Making sure we are. It says starting, but it. Seems to be, there we go. We are live on Facebook and live on YouTube. Okay, excellent. Well, welcome everybody to our podcast here on, what day is it today? May the 1st, May the Friday, Friday, May the 1st. Can you believe it? We're already May the 1st, um, still in pandemic. Um, but today here we got a friend of mine, a local physician, Dr. Michael Epitropoulos. Uh, he's a doctor of chiropractic, but also has a PhD, and he's a functional medicine doctor. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about what functional medicine really is, what it can do for people, and we're going to expand a little bit on, you know, functional medicine in relation to diabetes and other health issues and autoimmune diseases. So let's get started. Uh, welcome, Dr. Mike. How are you today? Good to see you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks for taking the time. Uh, could you describe to our viewers today what functional medicine really is? I start with the phrase that Hippocrates, uh, the father of medicine, ironically, said, let your food be your medicine and your medicine be your food. And that's really what functional medicine is all about, using the body's inner healing ability, activating it through using natural means. Number one is, of course, food. And how ironic that the father of medicine would say this, right? Mm -hmm. So the point of it is that as a doctor of functional medicine, I utilize number one, food and other natural means, uh, including supplementation, whether it be herbs, herbal medicines, homeopathic medicines, uh, nutraceuticals. These are all different means, tools that we use to activate the body's already ability to uh, heal. And this is really what functional medicine revolves around. Okay. And so as a functional medicine physician, people come to you with ailments and things like that. I assume, just like unlike a conventional doctor, you also look at the body as a whole. And I also assume you use a lot of types of testing to figure out what some markers are. So in functional medicine, what are some of the tests that you use to basically set a benchmark and diagnose? We use, but starting with the foundational tool that we all use as physicians, of course, number one, the blood, of course, mm -hmm. but we look at the blood from a different aspect. We're looking from the blood test for what, what uh, nutritional deficiencies the levels, the markers are reflecting, number one, okay? Number two, I use uh, some interesting technology called ele electrodermal screening. This is a German technology, and it's basically measuring through uh, act, uh, touching a cotton tip probe on points that we call acupressure points on the toes and the fingers that will then give us a measurement of energy patterns. The body is very electrical, very energetic, and we're measuring how energetic or non-energetic that particular patient I'm testing is. Very important tool. And it's energy and that it's, keeps us together. Exactly. Energy that's keeping us together, harnessing our body's healing ability. But we can see when with through that testing, what organ systems are distressed so that then we know what nutritional therapies to use to to help the body start to restore its ability to affect those distressed areas. We also use saliva testing, which uh, oftentimes we use for hormones to measure, again, the hormonal levels. We use uh, 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 food allergy testing is very uh, much used because, you know, we have food allergies. As the, and, you know, about 90% of health ailments can be related to what we're and eating. And most of those right? allergies are not acute. They're what they call the late onset. The late so onset. you wouldn't make a direct link between what you ate and your, you know, your ailments or your symptoms. And that's why we need to test for those. Exactly. And, and we also have this really interesting now, something really cutting edge, uh, Dr. Mike, is that we can do through DNA testing, through swabbing the mouth, we can identify what we call pathways, uh, certain pathways that are blocked genetically in each individual that will manifest in the different health conditions, but that will direct us, this testing, to what nutrition we need to give the body, the person, in order to affect that, that blockage, if you will, of that pathway. And I love that you bring that up because, I mean, there's so many genetic testing out there now. People usually don't know what, what to use, but that's why I need a, a physician to do that. But what people, what, what people don't understand is, yes, we all are genetic predisposed to some kind of ailment or disease. We are. 
But what people, and, and, and most people use it as an excuse, an excuse to do what? To not do something about their health. Oh, cancer runs in my family, so I'll probably die of cancer. Uh, heart disease runs in my cancer, I'll probably get a heart attack. Or, you know, my whole family is obese, that's why I'm overweight. And so it's an excuse not to change your life. But now there's a science, and you know what I'm talking about, epigenetics, which clearly has proven that even if we're predisposed to something with a simple lifestyle change, and that's what Dr. Mike can help with, right? With a simple lifestyle change, we can change that genetic predisposition for the next seven generations. Absolutely, and that's exciting stuff. Yep, that doesn't have to be an excuse. But it throws the onus on us because for so long, through the the the, the insurance of being everybody says, oh, I like the insurance that I don't have to be proactive in my health. I think what's happening now, and especially with this COVID-19, uh, Dr. Mike, I think we're finally realizing we must be proactive, take responsibility for our health mm -hmm. and to be you, to, with, through exercise and eating right and, and taking supplementation all, no matter what those epigenetic or no, what, no matter what the genetics is saying, oh, my father had heart disease or my mother had cancer, I can beat that yeah. by changing my lifestyle. No, that's correct. And I think this... This whole pandemic maybe has woken up a, f a fair percentage of the population. Uh, they are exercising more. They are trying to be a little bit more healthier. And so it's time to spend time with the family and realize what the important things in life are. Absolutely. And, and so hopefully uh, there's at least a percentage that, you know, that's going to go a little bit in a different direction. And I like to call it choose health freedom, right? Now, can you explain to the viewers also what the main differences are between allopathic medicine and then uh, functional medicine? This is really what has uh, separated us and is tremendous differentiation here. Allopathic medicine, we have to think of people like Dr. Louis Pasteur and Dr. Koch. Dr. Koch the, discovered the bacillus anthrax and, and Pasteur, of course, pasteurization, but they believed in what's called the germ theory. The germ theory is the basis of allopathic medicine, which means it's the germ that has the body. And just this is a perfect example of this virus right now. Okay, but the beauty of the uh, terrain theory, which is that's the body that has, in other words, the environment. It was uh, Beauchamp and Barnhart, Barnard, uh, doctors Barnard and Beauchamp, that came up with the idea that the environment, uh, your body, if you, if you make your body a favorable host, then it's going to allow whatever comes into your body, your body that ho that's hosting it. In other words, that, that uh, germ has a perfect setup to yeah. survive in and to flourish in, okay? And the point of it is that Interesting enough, Bernhardt and uh, Bochamp talk about detoxification and stimulating the immune system as a way to make your body an unfavorable house. How appropriate for today, yeah. right? Well, and again, you know, in, in the past, or even if you look at animals in the wild, you know, animals in the wild, they either die a natural death or they get eaten by another animal or traumatized by it. But there is no diabetes. There is no cancer. There is no Alzheimer's. Because obviously they act according to the laws of Mother Nature and they eat what Mother Nature provided them. And their immune system is strong. That's why no germs, no viruses, no bacteria can make them ill. And we humans, we were made that way too. But over time, we, we are making the wrong choices. And that's what separates us from animals. We have an awareness. We humans have the ability to choose our response to any stimulus. Animals don't. That's why they're in such good health. Right, and we have a choice. So now we're eating all those unnatural foods, chemicals, toxins. We're exposed to the environmental toxins, and that what has attacked our immune system. And so now, you know, for the first time, germs actually can overpower us, and they never were supposed to. Because if you look at Mother Nature again, you know, germs never attack animals that are alive. When an animal dies in the woods that's when the germs are going to go and turn everything back to dust in a few days. But otherwise, they have no chance, right? So it's because our immune system is so low and we're barely alive. That's why these germs can come in. Our body cannot neutralize it. And here we are, you know, germs actually taking over. But it's not supposed to happen, people. It's not supposed to happen. <laughs> you know, we're just so much toxicity. And, and, and because as you've been um, making reference, you know, when we consider the air quality, the water quality, I mean, water alone, we've got bromides and fluorides and chlorides. The air is full of pollution. The uh, foods are sprayed with Roundup and other chemicals and the herbicides and the pesticides. So we're, we're walking around just full of poison, 
full of toxin. And this is a basis, obviously, a toxic body is a sick body, right? Mm -hmm. And so the point of it is, and also the thing is, if you look at back about, we actually have 300 more foods today than we had 80 years ago. Yeah. Not that we have healthy foods today, it's boxed, they're processed, sure. yes. and way more than our grandparents and, and, uh, and such had. Plus, our grandparents still had their own yard and picked their own fruits and, and, and you know, and foods, too. Well, I noticed when you go to your Belgium, to your country, your mother has a beautiful uh, <laughs> garden, right? right? Yes, and you is that. that was it, would that be the norm in Belgium, that people are more um, conscious of having gardens and eating more healthily? Probably not to norm, but there are still, especially the older generation, you know, that have, that have the big yard and, and grow their own stuff, especially if it becomes a hobby for somebody to do. But yeah, I mean, I think that was great because even my children, they grew up here, right? But when they were little and even now when we go there, they were exposed to that. So my mom would, you know, say, hey, Aaron or hey, Kira, go in the yard and get me so many carrots and go to the chickens and get a few fresh eggs and get this and we're going to make this. And so they were exposed to that and that was good. But ideally, that's where it comes from, right? Because even, even now, me and you, because I meet you there sometimes, if we go to the health food store or to Love's or whatever, it's great. It's organic, wholesome food. But there's a time that lapses between harvesting and consumption. And during the time, a lot of the life nutrients are lost. And that's why we need to combine that with supplementation. We don't, we don't have a choice, really. Um, Dr. Mike, what are your thoughts on, on why we are so sick as a nation? And you went already a little bit over the toxins. Um, and what's... You know, what about our healthcare system contributing to that? Well, you know, unfortunately, I don't anymore. I don't even call it a healthcare system. I call it a sick care, a crisis care system. And nothing is more evident of that than right now because of this COVID-19. COVID-19 has thrown a fear in society because we have this sick care system that doesn't that doesn't emphasize prevention and wellness and it then shows up when we have these kind of catastrophes catastrophes happen so i really feel that this is what's contributing very much to why we have so much sickness and illness totally unnecessary so much of it is totally unnecessary would you not agree with that? Well, of course. And, you know, again, there's 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 a balance, right? Because they always say, oh, Dr. Mike is against conventional medicine. Of course, I'm not against conventional medicine. If I get a car accident, please bring me to the ER and please keep me alive, right? Um, but at the same time, while they're looking for solutions and stuff, would it not be prudent for our government and our physicians to tell people that there's plenty of scientific research that vitamin C would help boosting your immune system? Now they find more and more studies that did specific COVID might have to do something with a low selenium in the body and those types of things. So, so why not do both? You know, why not say these are preventative measures and it's important and get the information out there also because people think, you know, people, you know, always accuse of, of, of quackery and those types of things. And I mean, I, I'm laughing because when we're talking about the drug people, when we talk about a drug, there's only usually one study done and that study was done by whom? by the beneficiary, okay? But if you look on vitamin C, or if you look at uh, medical marijuana, there's thousands and thousands of peer-reviewed published studies all over the world, much more research than that one drug that they uh, make you try to take. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty hypocritical, let's put it that way, uh, the least. I want to give a quick example of what you're just referring to, Dr. Mike. There's um, an amino acid that we call a glutathione, a master builder, uh, it's the building block that it's so critical to our bodies that the deficiency of it is actually the first cause of death. And after the age of 20, our body declines in its production of this incredible amino acid. And, and a certain amount of it has to be what we call intracellular, intracellular in each cell of the body. Well, the point of it is that, that as critical as this is, if you ask your average doctor or and as a result, the average person, they wouldn't tell you the first thing about it. And it's actually the deficiency of it is a major cause of all these different finishes. Yes. There on PubMed is 140,000 research articles just on glutathione. So here's another example yeah. of something that's natural that has volumes, volumes of research. research. And the average doctor doesn't even know the word glutathione. Exactly. And, yeah. and we even have a product that we utilize. And that's one of the therapies I use when working with degenerative conditions is, is this glutathione and raising the levels of it. And the product that I use is actually listed in the physician's desk, desk reference. reference. But yet when I tell the patient to tell their doctor that this is, they can go and look it up, the doctor won't even go and look it up. Well, there's no medical reps coming to talk about it with lunch, are they? 
There you go. There you go. Now, um, from your perspective, uh, Dr. Mike, is there a common um, cause of all these degenerative conditions? Well, just as we made reference to it, the body becoming a very favorable host and mm. our lifestyle and such. And yes, that is the, the, the really the common denominator. But particularly, you know, what I wanted to give a reference to when we talk of a, a common denominator, for example, let's take autoimmune uh, diseases, for example. Mm -hmm. And this is a very uh, significant situation because this is almost to an epidemic. There, there's not one person that you talk to that says, oh, I was just diagnosed with an auto, uh, uh, autoimmune disease. So what happens is our gut, which is so critical to the health of our body, mm -hmm. it's, you know, 80 to 90% of our immune system is in our gut. In fact, lots of studies now are really bringing all this to, to, to the surface, right? It's our second brain. It makes more serotonin than the brain does. The the, the gut is a control tower of all the different organs. Mm -hmm. Well, the point of it is that when we, we consider the fact that that is, is you know, we, we abuse our gut health, right? And so what happens because of the American diet, what's happening is to begin with the lining of the wall of the gut is very thin. So because of the way we eat, we're getting uh, a reabsorption of, uh, let's say, an overgrowth of uh, virus, bacteria, candidiasis, as we call it, starts to get re-entering into our body, mm -hmm. starts recirculating. We call this leaky gut syndrome. This is the, the foundation of developing eventually yeah. autoimmune disease. So here your you, body's going to take itself. That's right. Yeah. And so we have this common denominator of poor gut health, which is everyone is affected because of the standard American diet. Yeah. And it results in uh, this hor horrific autoimmune issues. No, that's good. What about uh, the adrenal fatigue and underactive thyroid co coupled to that leaky well, gut? Well, you know, stress, right? Stress, 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 and more stress. In fact, uh, back in the 60s, for example, the house, uh, the average housewife would have, uh, and, and cortisol, as we know it, is the stress hormone our body creates when we're under the duress, right? Mm -hmm. and so the housewife in the 60s would create, or their body, her body would produce uh, five, uh, five, uh, would, uh, five times a week, she would be having an elevation of cortisol. Today's housewife is 10 times a day. The average person, I would have to tell you, and we would say yes, with COVID-19 and all the stress behind that, in addition to the daily stress of life. So the adrenal glands, which are the, the stress glands, right? Mm -hmm. They're having to really now work like crazy. So the average person walking around has it's, it's adrenal exhaustion. In fact, almost similar to being a post-traumatic stress PTSD. But right? constantly, yeah. And then the thyroid is well in line because the thyroid and adrenals work together. The thyroid is impacted not just from the stress too significantly as the adrenal, but now we're talking about also the fluoride and the chloride in the water, the bromides, which is, is killing the thyroid. Mm -hmm. I mean, so here's two very important glands of what a, a system called the endocrine system, the adrenal thyroid, they're under duress, but they are also the control towers of the body that control every body function. Yeah. And, and they, as they fatigue too, can lend themselves to the autoimmune syndrome. So hence the slow metabolism, et cetera, et cetera. Weight gain, you name the it. Cascade, a, a right? cascade of effects, yes. Now, um, speaking about autoimmune decisions, conditions, diabetes, especially, we want to talk about a little bit today, is epidemic proportions also. Um, give us a little overview, but also explain to the viewers, because there's still a lot of people confused, what's the real difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes? Well, first and foremost, uh, when we look at the situation with diabetes and that is qualifying as, a, as an autoimmune disease, and we have to think about this is an epidemic proportion disease of anything out there. It's becoming a plague. When you think that one, it's, we're probably wide, right at one out of three people. What I looked up here, um, worldwide, we have 350 million people, diabetes, uh, Medicare, every uh, one in three dollars, one in three dollars, 30 percent of the Medicare budget is spent on diabetes alone. Uh, the healthcare cost, one in every ten dollars, is spent just on diabetes. All right, and two thirds of the population is obese. And yet, this is a mo very preventable, right? Very preventable condition. So let's contrast them. So we have the diabetes one and diabetes two. Mm -hmm. What well, diabetes one is more of an autoimmune, as we call it, very genetically affecting. And it's really the body's inability to make insulin, 
is di type 1 diabetes, okay? And diabetes 2, which is, is really extremely prevalent, and these numbers you're giving is most a lot more of the diabetes 2 because mm -hmm. that's even more lifestyle dependent. dependent, right? So we have now a situation where the body, there are cells in the pancreas called islet cells, alpha cells, and they those cells are going to regulate we have a, a it's a hormonal control system. The, the bottom line is our body is unable to utilize now this insulin is being made. The body is becoming resistant to it because of the foods that we're eating. The standard American diet mm -hmm. is creating this insensitivity to the insulin after a while because we're eating starch laden foods and we're not exercising. So this insulin now is spiking and we're not utilizing it because the insulin is the regulator. It's the it's the hormone that regulates yes. the sugar, right? So so the cells cannot take the sugar they, up. They can, exactly right. Yeah. They cannot take it up. And so it's all diet related. Especially type 2. Now, the type 1 diabetes, and this is a question, the type 1 diabetes, are you born with it or can you acquire it later in life too, it's the type 1? can be acquired. That's the that's the thing. I and just wanted to make that that's clear. The, and I'm glad you did. Yes. Because he, there goes, the like you said originally, oh, people make excuse, oh, I have it in my family, so I'm going to have type 1. No, you can acquire it according to your lifestyle again. And mm -hmm. go here we go to the terrain theory, right? Yes. You've made your body a favorable host for type 1. Well, there's many studies now out there too that one of those reasons why you can acquire it later in life is because cow's milk, okay? Exactly. And the casein, when it enters the blood, it makes antibodies. And it's the antibodies that destroy our pancreas. And there you end up with type 1 diabetes later in life, okay? Now, um, the... Uh, <clears throat> Let's see here. What I like to do is, um, Dr. Mike, is go a little bit over diabetes and um, let people know not just about the dairy, but also processed meats on how research, scientific research and Harvard's, you know, longitudinal studies have shown how that detrimental, especially those two food groups are to our whole body, but also contributing to diabetes. Um, so the first, the first study says that if children have diabetes, okay, their lifespan shortens with 19 years. That just a fact, 19 years, okay? Uh, <clears throat> a Harvard study showed that one serving, and this is about the meats, of processed meats increased the risk of diabetes by 51%, only one serving. Okay. Now, this is kind of ironic, right? Because there's plenty of studies that show that the dairy and the processed meats, you know, cause all these diseases, especially diabetes. And we'll go over some of the studies. But then let's say you're diagnosed with diabetes. You go to the ADA, American Diabetic Association website, and you look at the meal plans on that website, and they're loaded with what? Dairy and processed meats. So you would think that they want to prevent and educate the, their patients on how to, you know, get better or how to prevent it. And it's quite the opposite. And then you wonder why, how come? Because this is not just opinion. This is Harvard studies research that show that a vegan or a vegetarian or plant-based diet is the way to go. And we need to avoid the processed meats and the dairy. But then you figure out who sponsors the American Diabetic Association. And then we figure out it's Velveeta, it's Kraft, it's Bumblebee, it's Oscar Mayer, and the list goes on. So people really need to think twice and do a little bit more research before they blindly follow the meal plan on those organizations' websites, that's for sure. Um, but let's talk a little bit about dairy and diabetes and autoimmune diseases. Because the dairy produces a lot of mucus, mucus in our body, a lot of allergies, uh, asthma, multiple sclerosis, type 1 diabetes, all could be caused by this dairy consumption. And I've been advocating many, many years that we need to cut milk and dairy out of our diet because it's really a poison. And people say, how do you mean it's a poison? So I want to take a little bit of time to, to go over some key points why milk is not necessary. First of all, and this is not an opinion, this is biological fact. When we are born as humans, you know, we produce an enzyme called lactase. And what does lactase do? It's supposed to break down lactose, meaning the mother's milk, so it can be absorbed by the baby, right? But it's also a known physiological fact, biological fact, 
that when we are at age one, approximately, the body stops producing that enzyme. Why? Because Mother Nature does not intend to for us to keep on hanging on the mother's breast. All right, we got to come off that breast and we got to start drinking what? Water, like any other wild animal in the water, in the in the wild. We don't have to, you know, drink anything else. No orange juice, no soda, no monsters, no Red Bulls, no nothing. Water is what we're supposed to drink, right? Um, but if we keep uh, giving our, you know, one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old, our uh, children milk, you know, they do not have the enzyme to break it down. And that's why we end up with all those ear infections and allergies and asthma and eventually all the immune conditions. So that's one thing that I wanted to uh, make clear. The other one is the big myth that the dairy industry really projected on all of us that we need milk because it makes us strong. It has calcium. It's good for our bones. And that's a total myth, right? First of all, you know, cow's milk has way too much or much more calcium in it than human milk. Uh, we don't need all that uh, calcium because uh, calves have to grow up much faster than humans do. Uh, but it's also the wrong type of calcium. And really, calcium has nothing to do with uh, being strong and preventing osteoporosis. Uh, all the studies show that uh, calcium has nothing, zero, 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 zero squat to do with osteoporosis and osteopenia. There was a Harvard, Harvard research study that involved 72,337 postmenopausal women. Okay, they were followed for 18 years, which is called a prospective analysis, right? And what was the conclusion of that study? Milk, nor a uh, diet high in calcium, prevented osteopenia or osteoporosis, okay? So what does the study, the studies uh, out there in the research show about milk? It increases the risk for fractures. It doesn't even prevent it. It actually increases the risk for, fra for fractures. Uh, it increases the risk for cancer, and it reduces life expectancy. That's what dairy consumption uh, does for you. Globally, also, it's been proven that countries that consume more milk have a much higher rate of osteopenia and osteoporosis, right? So that's, that's the calcium myth. Uh, they did a great job because I remember when they used Michael Jordan with the milk <laughs> mustache, and that's how you become strong, and that's how you become, you know, Michael Jordan, right? Remember that? <laughs> But milk, guys, is not, it, it's not beneficial for you. It's harmful for you. It's loaded with hormones. But milk, milk is a hormonal liquid. And even if they try to sell you, you know, uh, hormone-free milk, it, it doesn't make any sense because milk is loaded with sex hormones, right? And so whether you look at organic milk or conventional milk, they all have galactose in it. They all have saturated fat in it and obviously cholesterol, right? So... So that's the hormones, loaded with hormones, which explains a lot of the problems that we have when we drink milk. Uh, another point, pus. It's always a good thing to talk about, right? Pus. Um, you know, people say, ah, oh, there's no pus in milk. You can take any milk, any sample, you find a lot of pus. Actually, it's allowed. There is a legal limit of 750,000 somatic pus cells, not per gallon, per cc of milk. Why is there so much pus in the cow's milk? Well, it's easy, right? First of all, they need to put a lot of hormones, especially bovine growth in the calves because they want them to grow up way too fast so they can milk them. Then they need to keep the cows pregnant all the time because they want to keep milking them, okay? So they're going to cause infections. To prevent the infections, they put all the cows on antibiotics, 70 to 80 different kinds even of antibiotics. So that's what's happening because of the infections. Their pus ends up in the milk, okay? So... Cheers to that one. Um, we also have to talk about, when we talk about milk and other dairy products, about casein, which is the protein, right? Now, human milk has 2.7 grams of casein in it. Cow's milk, 26 grams, okay? That's 10 times more casein in cow's milk. Now, what does that do? Casein breaks down in what they call casomorphins in the body. And they attach to the same receptors in the brain, as heroin. That's why drinking milk actually is milk is actually addictive. Okay. But if we give infants cow's milk, okay, they play a huge role in autism, in SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, etc., because of those overload of caseins in cow's milk. And then I want to finish up by talking about my little rant about the dairy industry, is that I want to share some statistics with you from the Center for Food Safety. Okay. 
First of all, uh, I knew that all these animals get drugs. What I didn't know is that from all the drugs produced for us, 80% goes to the animals and only 20% comes to us, 80%. Animals get 450 different drugs. So our, our pigs, our cows, and our chickens, they get 400 different types of drugs, okay? Now, here's some scary statistics. About 3,000 people per year die directly from consuming meat. For example, salmonella, 3,000. Now, that's the same as people that died at 9-11, but every year, just from eating meat, okay? Now, there's 20,000 people per year that die, okay? That's seven times the amount of the people that died at 9-11 from the antibiotic-resistant bacteria directly uh, consuming that meat, okay? Now, we already talked about that cow's milk can uh, uh, cause type 1 diabetes later on in life because of the antibodies that uh, destroy the pancreas. So, so we need to stay away from, not just for diabetes. We talked about cancer the other day, anything. We got to stay away from meats. We will have a podcast on meats and protein and animal versus plant-based protein coming up very soon because it's so important to really explain all the reasons. Um, but we need a plant-based diet. We need to avoid the dairy and we need to avoid, um, you know, those meats and processed meats. All right. So the last thing I want to say about the meats, though, um, is there's about 800 studies out there. Not recent studies. This has been known for a long time, right, that show that processed meats, you know, uh, they increase the risk for cancer drastically. And with the processed meats means what? Canned meats, bacon, sausage, uh, you know, cold cuts, deli, all those types of things drastically increase the risk of cancer. <clears throat> and here we are in the pandemic talking about the, the WHO, the World Health Organization. Did you know that the, 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 the WHO lists processed meats as a class one carcinogen? You didn't know that, did you? No, they don't advertise that, but you can go look it up. Processed meats are a class one carcinogen. Next to what? Tobacco, okay, asbestos, and plutonium. Now, imagine that I want to feed my kids asbestos. Am I going to be charged with that? Is that going to be a criminal thing? Yes. So the question is, why are we allowed to feed ourselves, but especially our kids and school meals with processed meats? Okay. You need to think about those things, okay? Look it up. Very interesting. So, Dr. Mike, I, I ranted off a little bit on what we should not eat, processed meats and, you know, dairy. So now, what should we eat to make our body an unfavorable host for these conditions? Well, first of all, I want to interject something, which is excellent, all that you pointed out, Dr. Mike. One thing that I want to emphasize, and it's really interesting, actually, this milk that uh, Dr. Mike is saying is the milk that is not the same milk that back from our uh, grandparents, which is raw milk, which they had back then. And the raw milk was without the casein and without the additives and without the hormones and without the, all of this that is creating this havoc, if you will, mm -hmm. and poison literally to the body. Mass production. Mass production. And the irony of this, folks, is that raw milk is illegal to buy and to sell. In fact, uh, there's a there's a Amish population. That, in fact, when I used to practice up in Michigan, most of my patients, I had half my patients were Amish, uh -huh. and there are Amish folks that try to sell raw milk because that's this, in this natural form next to mother's milk, breast milk. Mm. Raw milk is uh, the most nutritious uh, next to that, and here it's illegal. It's illegal for. In fact. There's a picture at an Amish uh, a health food store in Indiana, and on the picture, it's an Amish man sitting in a prison cell next to another guy, and they're talking, and the Amish man says, well, what are you in for? And this, he says, well, I'm in for killing three people. And he goes to the Amish man, what are you in for? Well, I'm trying to sell raw milk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? And this really summarizes everything you're talking about, yeah, right? It does. It's and a it's, very good analogy. It, it's yeah. a, incredible. But when we talk about... What can we do health, uh, yeah. health food, uh, first of all, food-wise to affect diabetes, to help manage it effectively? Because so the majority of diabetes can be managed uh, with, with a diet, yeah. with intervention of supplementation, with exercise. So what I tell my patients is, A, we want to start eating more fruits, green, leafy vegetables, 
Dark skin fruit, the uh, high antioxidant, which is the darker the skin fruit, the better, the blueberries, strawberries, raspberries, blackberries. Uh, we want to really eliminate, reduce the breads, the pastas, the rice, potatoes, and sugar. Just get, get, get rid of the sugar. I mean, we could do a whole thing on sugar, That's right? Sure. It's poison. It's, I mean, literally, it's poison. It's like battery acids affect if we had battery acid building up in our body, right? And so the American standard American diet is what you guys need to eliminate. Really, it comes down to what's the standard American diet, which I call the SAD diet. Uh, breads, pastas, rice, potatoes, and sugar, which is all uh, spiking that insulin that we talked about, which is creating, uh, our, causing our pancreas to really just literally give out. Right so out. we yeah. want to have the, the, the vegetables, the green leafy vegetables, the dark skin fruits, the proteins, the good fats, the really, I mean, those Alpha are awesome fats, that we yeah. know with the ketogenic uh, program. And, and, and so the good fats include avocados, coconut oil, olive oil, right? Mm -hmm. And really now we are also want to look at intermittent fasting. And I'll even have you say a few words on that, Doc. But, you know, you folks listening to us, if you were to do even one day a week where you give yourself, a, a, you know, the average person is eating grazing over 15 hours a day. And it's no wonder then they're we have an epidemic of diabetes. And especially what's really sad is our children are obese because they're not, that's another, another talk, right? <laughs> Lack of exercise. The kids are, you see so many obese children. What's their, where's, where are they headed as an adult? But if you fast, in other words, if you stop eating, let's say, and your last meal is at 6 p.m. supper, and then you don't eat again till noontime the next day, you've given yourself 18 hours of not eating. And folks, when you do that, your fat burning starts to engage and you're burning fat for fuel instead of glucose, right? Mm -hmm. And you're losing weight and you're stabilizing your blood sugar. Many studies have been done that when you intermittent fast, you are going, and if you're a diabetic or pre-type 2, which is a huge population we even haven't talked about, mm -hmm. that are in that pre-type pre pre yes. 2 ready, ready to plunge into diabetes, you will reverse it. And studies have shown even as a diabetic, if you intermittent fast, you reverse it. And it's just a matter of, giving yourself an 18 hour window before you eat. And when you do eat, eat again, as we discussed the, the vegetables, the dark skin fruit, the, the good fats, the mm -hmm. proteins, right? Yeah. And it's a good point that he brings up because we never talked about fasting. We talk about many things, but we'll never talk about fasting. And so in the past, I tried to do a two, three day fast and all those type of recommendations. And that's really tough. And so the last two years I've been doing exactly what he says, because to me, it's not difficult to have my last meal at, actually my only meal, but that's another uh, reason, another, another, another podcast, but at 6 a.m., at 6 p.m. ish, early evening, because based on what you eat, your digestive system will take three, four hours or longer to digest. So you, you don't want to eat late because then it's working while you sleep and then you can't recover, replenish, repair, right? So before you go to sleep, digestive uh, efforts are done. And now during sleep, you can do what? You know, replenish, repair, regenerate, and get your body ready for the morning. That's why I never eat breakfast either, okay? They always, it's, it's one of the biggest myths that's explained very well in very my book so. is that breakfast is the most important meal on, in the day. And it's totally not true. It's quite the opposite because if you have a nutritious meal at 6 p.m., it gets digested, you sleep and your body replenishes and regenerates. In the morning, you have all the energy, all the nutrients from that healthy meal yesterday. Why would you have to eat? It's going to get another big burden on your digestive system. It's like when, when people have an eight to five work day and you go and have a heavy lunch and you come back to work, how do you feel? You don't want to work. You don't and you're going to do a half-ass job at work and you're going to do a half-ass job in digestion because your body needs the energy for digestion. Again, look at that animals in, 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 in the wild. After they eat, what do they do? They go lay down in the shade for hours and hours Why things digest, right? So I do exactly what you say, and it's very easy to eat at night, skip breakfast, and then only eat something at lunch again. And it's a very easy habit. Now, habits can be changed fast. Usually you try 12 times, and it becomes something that you like instead of dislike. Okay, so there was a very good point you brought up. Uh, not only are you going to become in, uh, get in a ketogenic state doing that, but what's also important to understand is that during the time your body has time to replenish, repair, and renew. And when you don't give your body that time, you wear out and you wear out and you wear out. And that's why everybody's always tired and there's no energy to do anything fun after they're done working. And you know, one other thing, in addition to uh, Dr. Mike, we want to talk about 
here's some examples of uh, nutritional or vitamins that I like to use to regulate to help the blood sugar to to take the the, the stress off of the pancreas and help to uh, help the body react better to utilizing insulin. So we use things like, for example, besides the fact we mentioned. You know, protein is a part of the, the ketogenic and good fat. But we talk about things like Gemina Silvestra, as, which is an herb. We talk about vanadium, utilizing that. We talk about chromium. Chromium we use. D3 is very important to regulating blood sugar. I also use, I made reference to it earlier, the glutathione therapy. Enhancing your glutathione levels is going to help stabilize your, your blood sugar and, and allow the body to better utilize insulin. And we use uh, even nucleotide therapy. Uh, these are therapies. The nucleotides are actually what our body actually makes on its own, just like with thyroid. But as we get older, after the age of 20, it, a decline in production. So we have to take an outside source of that, a supplement it to start raising the nucleotide levels as well. But that's the beauty. These are things in nature, right? These are things that we have our access to. They can't, they don't harm. They don't harm. They, they don't optimize. Harm. They optimize. They accelerate. They, they maximize. They potentiate. And, 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 and prayerfully, because of this COVID-19, there's an epiphany that's going to happen, that's happening, mm -hmm. that folks are realizing, hey, we have access to these things. These are in nature. These are, these, are, uh, these, are gonna, these are safe and effective with lots of studies behind them, right? Yes. So this is why it's exciting. And I appreciate you doing these podcasts, Dr. Mike, because we you know as practitioners, as, as physicians, the, 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 the word a doctor means teacher, right? We're teaching, educating. we're giving, educating, yeah. we're empowering. And that's really the goal is to empower to you folks listening. We want to give you this information that will empower you to have optimum health. Yeah. And again, you know, just, just to close the podcast, you know, it's said that, that the mainstream media and regular physicians, you know, continue to say there's no proof that these natural ways work. And first of all, they can't harm like, all the other things or the conventional therapies that they offer, they do harm. Drugs do have side effects. First of all, there's no harm done here. Second of all, it's a total blatant lie that there's no peer-reviewed scientific published research on all these therapies and all the nutrients. There's thousands of it all over the world. They just turn a blind eye and they just don't want to talk about it. Any last words, Dr. Mike? Well, I really appreciate being here with you today. And if you, I'll put in a quick... Uh, uh, contact information. Yes, um, Go ahead. I am. I am. I am. You folks uh, can reach me. Um, first of all, email wise, I'm always available for your emails to answer questions at healingphysician at aol.com. I am uh, accessible phone wise 386 274 2520. And again, thank you so much for the opportunity to. I always say, remember that uh, good health is a journey, not a destination. That is quite right. What are you going to do without health? You can't enjoy your money. You can't enjoy your time. You cannot enjoy anything without good health. And that's why we say choose health freedom.